If you're curious to hear a little music from our guest Carla Lucero, who we spoke to in our most recent episode, check out E4TT's annual concert of music by women and non-binary composers, Midnight Serenades, on January 25th. Welcome to For Good Measure, an interview series celebrating diverse composers and other creative artists, sponsored by a grant from the California Arts Council. I'm Nanette McGinnis, Artistic Executive Director of Ensemble for These Times. In this week's episode, we continue our Da Capo Conversations, a mini-series where we'll be giving familiar segments a topical twist. Today we revisit Marcus Norris's and Sainova's perspectives on their paths to becoming a composer. Here's what Marcus Norris had to say. So when I first started getting into making beats, I was like around 13 years old. Um, And for me, like at that point, it was just super personal and super introspective. Like I didn't even I I didn't even show it to anybody. Um, It was purely for me, purely to process what was going on in my life and the things around me. And I feel like as I've grown and I've added in more musical styles into my like my language, um, I've, I've kept on to that. Like I, I never let go of it. And I, th- I think that's benefited me a lot. Um, it just is still so personal. It's still so introspective for me. And it's still my way of like processing the world. And I don't know if I would have gotten that if I started with like learned concert music do you know what I mean there's uh, a lot more of a barrier to entry and a lot more like formal uh training regimen in place whereas you know with with making beats or rap it's like you make your own way you know what I mean that uh, outsider art type of thing here's what St. Ova had to say yeah um I feel I feel very thankful to kind of come full circle. And I painfully remember the moments when my mom uh, forced me to go to piano lessons, first at our church and then at a conservatory. And um, I didn't practice, uh, so my progress was limited. And um, then I eventually um, persuaded her to let me learn the saxophone instead. the reason why um, the reason why that that moment is so meaningful to me is because now as a composer, um, I'm using piano as my main instrument, and I'm literally, you know, uh, two years ago uh, taking piano lessons in Berlin, starting from scratch, <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, from there. Uh, uh, progressing and now uh, for me it's it's more of an issue of like dexterity so no so no Rachmaninoff pieces anytime soon (laughs) but at least you know for for the purpose of uh, composing and and getting the harmonies and and the melody um, you know I'm able to pick that up now but you know had I gone with my mom's suggestion I (laughs) it would be a, a, a breeze the composing aspect or or essentially um bringing the sounds from in my head out you know so so yeah it's it's been um the journey where uh i i I, I played music in uh, high school when i was in a marching band and uh, i saw music purely as uh, recreational um and i was in essence mimicking an older cousin who was also he played tenor sax in the marching band and i ended up playing um uh alto sax and um and then i was in other bands there concert band jazz band and because i had a just a naturally good amateur um still lacking dexterity but because of the amateur <laughs> the the um con- conductor put me on oboe bassoon and bass clarinet just to fill in wherever what's needed so, um, say I did that, but you know, I have to say, you to me, you're using two very different parts of the brain when you're playing other people's music versus composing your own. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, really, when I when I decided after practicing law and um, 
And for six months, I tried to really learn music theory and continue being a very good lawyer. And I found it incredibly challenging because um, there's a there's a quote that the law is a jealous mistress in the sense where um, it's so demanding. Um, and so when I <laughs> found myself kind of faltering on both ends, I decided I needed to um, really uh, decide which one I wanted to continue in. And I decided music and, um, and the whole music aspect came um, with surprise as I was uh, getting over heartbreak um, uh, one evening <laughs> and I was walking down Halston Street in New York City and I just started humming something that I really enjoyed and it brought tears to my eyes and um, I recorded it. And I, that was like the, the beginning um, of the end of my legal career. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it, it's, um, it's kind of been uh, this process where, so that was like 2017 where I decided um, I wanted to learn music and then by 2019, I was able to um, fully uh, uh, become a full-time composer. Um, and thanks to my time in Berlin, I was able to um, make my vocation also um, uh, my livelihood. Thank you for listening to Four Good Measures De Capo Conversations, and a special thank you to our guests for joining us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast by clicking on the subscribe button and support us by sharing it with your friends, posting about it on social media, and leaving us a rating and a review. To learn more about E4TT, our concert season online and in the Bay Area, or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit us at www.e4tt.org. This podcast is made possible in part by a grant from the California Arts Council and generous donors like you. Four Good Measures produced by Nanette McGinnis and Ensemble for These Times and designed by Brennan Stokes, with special thanks to co-producer and audio engineer Stephanie M. Newman. Remember to keep supporting equity in the arts and tune in next week for Good Measure.